Hello, everybody. Uh, we're here for the fourth installment of the uh, SEO Help um, series of videos with uh, Mr. David Amerland, who is the author uh, who wrote this excellent uh, book on SEO. And we're just kind of going through every single chapter. There are 20 chapters. So today we're at number four, which is other profiles. And, and um, if you even looked a little bit about I mean, I researched a little bit or looked on the Google Plus about semantic search. Nobody else comes up but David Amerland. If you look on the Google, basically, it's just everybody else. It's kind of it's kind of like a tree. You have David Amerland, and then you have everybody else. That's kind of how it works. So that's the introduction to David Amerland. Hello, David. Oleg, hi. How are you? I'm doing good, thank you. So we'll do we'll do today the. Um, the we'll, we'll talk about that, and then of course, if you don't know me, then basically. Um, okay, so this is exactly what happens if you don't have your profile set up and people are trying to find something about you. Everything goes <laughs> kind of into, you know, ether. And there's nothing there and that's what we're <laughs> going to talk about today we're going to talk about the fact that you know the reason the profiles are important is because it's a way for people who don't know you to get to they have some information to know some stuff about what you who you are what you do uh potentially what you're trying to accomplish you know we talked last in the uh, installment number three last time step number three we talked about the importance of having properly set up google plus profiles in terms of what kind of information to put in and uh, how important it is to both the SEO efforts and at the same time, just on the human level, somebody comes to see if uh, they should uh, interact with you or follow you or do some business with you. If they don't know anything about you, then it's not going to happen. So how would they know anything about you? Well, they can talk to you, but most people don't just walk on the street to some stranger. So hello, I'm thinking about buying something from you. What exactly do you do? Nobody does stuff like that. Um, or at least normal people don't, let's put it this way. And um, so usually what happens, obviously you're in an online environment, you can't do any elevator pitches or anything on the fly. So you have the profile that is kind of an introduction to uh, you as a person or as a business entity or as both. Uh, like in my case, for example, uh, things that I do, it's pretty much me and myself and I. And so a lot of times when I introduce Myself, I also wind up introducing the stuff that I do, and so there is it's a single entity type enterprise. And David Amerland actually is in the same boat. I mean, he is uh, he's got a little army of minions. If you haven't seen the movie, you can go see the movie of minions to see those are the people working for him behind the scenes. But the man in front of everything that's being done in terms of writing these books and and doing these uh, you know great posts that he does and everything else, it's just him. Correct, David. There's nobody else doing your stuff, right? Well, there's always Nike helping out, but you know that's it's always debatable how useful she is. Right, but we're talking about English end of it, so Nike doesn't do English at all. She helps another So, David, with with that kind of uh, intro here, you know, if we put Google Plus aside, now we're talking other profiles. I guess the the first question we'll do a generic question is why are profiles important? on other platforms other than Google Plus? Well, there, there are several layers to this. And it, it appears to be a simple question, but it, the answer is not simple at all. Um, the, the primary one is that search works these days based on entities. And entities are fully fleshed out people, places, objects, things, the same way we understand them. Just like you can't just be all like just here. You have to be Oleg everywhere. And if you're not Oleg everywhere, then I wouldn't necessarily trust you, right? Because if you're Oleg on Google Plus and you go by the name, I don't know, a different name on Facebook and a different name on Twitter and so on, um, then there's a little bit of a disconnect in terms of your identity, which creates um, a slightly elevated sense of risk in terms of connecting with you. Um, it would be fine for us to chat, for instance, but I would feel very confident sending you money so you can ship something back to me. And the moment we get into that kind of uncertainty, um, there's not real 
basis for any kind of transactional exchange to take place. And that includes information, that includes um, any kind of uh, sort of a, a factual uh, basis, as well as a more commercial transaction. And that's the primary reason for having a consistency across digital profiles. But there's an a second element to that. And the second element to that, which is where the complexity comes in, is the human factor. Um, nobody from your audience is going to be entirely and exclusively focused on a, one platform. You know, some people have a favorite one, some people have two favorite ones, and some would be just social butterflies flitting about ev everywhere and spending five minutes here and five minutes there which means that you do not necessarily know how people are actually going to find you. They might find you through a tweet. They might find you on Facebook, if you're on Facebook. They might find you through a particular post or picture which you share on Instagram. They might find you through a post on Google+. The essence is that the moment people find you, they are not necessarily convinced unless they can follow you across the web in different kinds of platforms, and a lot of people do that. When they do that, they have to feel that they're actually following the same person. And as people, we are quite adept at doing this. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same name. I mean, in the past, we used to have, I don't know, X, Y, Z in one platform and A, B, C in a different platform. And we thought that was okay. It was no problem. We get into semantic web and all the platforms become transparent, information and porous, information flows from one to the other, and the dots, so to speak, begin to become joined. The way we do it as people is also the way search does it in a way as um, uh, essentially an artificial intelligence engine. So it is hugely important to try and make this joining of the dots as easy as possible. Uh, that includes the pictures we put up, the names we use, the descriptions we use, what we do, and then how we do it. So you know, if you say, for instance, you sell secondhand cars in one platform, then you can't go and say, hey, I also sell fresh fish in the other platform. <laughs> the two don't, you know, there's a huge disconnect between the two. And that's that's the, the primary reason. This is this is why um, it is so important to actually have that consistency of approach across all these different platforms, which doesn't necessarily mean, and I've got to stress this, that you have to be exactly the same. Every platform has a slightly different feel. Some are more playful than others. Some are more... Uh, pictorial, perhaps, you know, if you're if you're on um, Instagram, by necessity, you're using pictures. Um, if you're on Pinterest, again, you're using pictures and collections of them. But the sense that comes from all these activities has to have a cohesion. So we must be able to get a sense of your identity. Okay, so that kind of takes us into the next uh, segment. I think it's a um, great way to get into the deal that different platforms have very varied rules for um, profiles. For example, on Twitter, they give you a lot less room in terms of what you can put in for your profile, same thing with Instagram, actually, uh, than you can on Google+, Plus, for example, or you can on Facebook. So how do you, semantically speaking, of course, or semantically search speaking, I should say, how do you create the same persona or the same identity where it took you a thousand words to describe your whatever you wanted to describe on Google Plus, and now you're you know, limited to a couple of hundred characters or a couple of hundred words. How do you mesh the two, number one? And the second part of the question is, do you recommend being just shrinking everything down but saying exactly the same thing for the sake of being visible similarly, like you mentioned, or do you recommend actually looking at it from a standpoint of whatever your concentration will be on that platform that's how a profile should go based on that. Well, okay, I mean, this is a great question. Um, usually, Only ask those. <laughs> uh, the, the tendency is to try and be the same. Um, sometimes we get a copy paste effect and it always jars because it feels wrong. Um, and at other times we get a very similar feel which doesn't always work. You're right in that every platform is a little bit different. I mean, even Facebook, um, it's used primarily, you know, primarily for friends and family, but also you can use it to connect with business people across your, your industry or your audience. And the approach there has to be a little bit different because it is a different kind of place. It is um, perhaps less, it has less depth than, than 
arguably G plus has. It has more um, um, volume in, than Twitter, which has only 200 characters. So how do you reconcile all this? And, and really, the only guideline which can really work here is be consistent. Um, you can be consistent, certainly, by the easiest thing to do, linking back to your website across all of these. So suddenly I think, hey, the Oleg I met on Facebook, which goes to um, PCS, is also the same Oleg who's on Google+, Plus, which also goes to PCS. And perhaps the Oleg on Facebook is a little bit different because he doesn't spend a lot of time there. Uh, he may not be as witty, he just kind of sounds very serious. He got on Google+, Plus, and you, know, you can say, get a sense of his sense of humor and understand who he is because the level of, in, of engagement and interaction is a lot deeper and a lot more involved. See how both of those would go to the same place. Then you begin to understand that this is the same person and he's simply interacting within the spirit of the platform, if we can call it that. So that consistency is never easy to, to get because uh, in order to get that, we really need to, to do a lot of hard work behind the scenes, primarily inside our heads if we're working on our own, like you and I, where you say, okay, what is it that I actually do? Who is it who I really am? And I know this sounds ridiculous because we ask these questions, you think, well, you know, I'm David and you're Oleg, so that shouldn't be difficult to define. But actually it is. Uh, we're talking about identity. We're talking about how that is formed and how it is ascribed. Historically, these were things which came from our surroundings. They were given to us or imposed upon us. And now we actually have the ability to define them and then project them. You can't project what you can't define. You can't define what you can't understand. So really, there has to be a high level of introspection. It sounds almost psychological at a personal level. To a certain degree, it is. But when it comes to the brand itself, it definitely has to take place. And if we're talking about a brand or a company where they have to do the same thing, then we're talking about a group activity, which means that essentially, you know, if you're running a company, you're running 10 employees, and PCS has specific values which you set, then every one of those 10 employees needs to completely understand what those values are. They need to be able to project them just as well as you can. Otherwise, you may, not, may as well not have those 10 employees working for you. So these are the challenges which a brand will face. And then the question becomes, OK, how do I make sure that those people who work for me actually understand those values? You can't impose them upon them and say, you know, these are the values. You have to project them or you're fired. Well, you could try, but it'll backfire because people don't believe in it and it comes across and people will slip or make mistakes or simply don't care. They think, oh, well, fire me. I'll find another job. So basically, that, that's why I don't have anybody working for me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Safest way, probably. <laughs> but yeah. essentially, it, it comes down to a lot of internal communication within companies. And, and I see this within large companies where when we talk about social media, when it comes to projecting what is important to the company in terms of the values, then we come into internal trust issues where the people who are in command and they're in the C-suite don't necessarily always trust the people on the ground who actually do the work. And you think, okay, if you don't trust them, how do we establish this level of trust? Because it has to be a two-way thing. For you to trust them, they need to be able to trust in your leadership. If they trust in your leadership, they must be able to understand your vision. To understand your vision, they must be able to understand the company initiatives and the imperatives and the pressures put upon the company. So suddenly we get a bilateral flow of information going throughout the company, which means it also begins to become less compartmentalized. It also begins to become more porous internally about how information flows. And then things begin to change significantly within that environment. And in, in a nutshell, this is the challenge of our times. This is why social media is so challenging and so difficult for companies to get. Not because they don't know how to use Twitter or they don't know how to use Facebook, but because they have to change internally in terms of the internal structures, their mindset, the approach, the internal politics. And the larger the company, the larger the challenge. The smaller it is, the easier it is. You know, for you and me, it is incredibly easy to manage. It's just me. So I don't really need to have a dichotomy with myself. I, you know, once I have the internal thinking process and I understand what I'm doing, it becomes very easy to project. But if you're running 10, 20, 30, 1,000, 20,000 people, then the job becomes um, exponentially magnified and the level of difficulty becomes exponentially magnified with it. So again, going back to what we were discussing, you know, 
let's get back a little bit, not get so philosophical here. Um, if you're talking about, for example, let's let's take this twenty thousand dollar company, uh, or it doesn't really matter. I mean, what you're describing is to me sounds like more of a about us page where you can lay out the vision and the game plan and what the company is about everything. And that to me sounds like a really elaborate, well thoughtful, I mean, well thought out and constructive uh, page about the company. But we're talking about a 200 character situation on Twitter that is supposed to describe this. And there is no way even you could put together something that you just you know projected into 200 character i mean 200 characters so going back to the reality at hand here if you do have a twitter profile what do you put in there number one my second part of the question is are you talking to google or are you talking to people who are you talking to because you have such a small amount of space you want to make sure google indexes it correctly no question about that but at the same time it, google is consuming everything from the you know behind the scenes so to speak you're trying to put this out to your audience so when you look at it from that perspective when people come it cannot be just something with a bunch of keywords or phrases speaking to a search engine you got to talk to people like you got to talk to people so how do you i, I understand it's not simple I'm, I'm not you know trying to put you in a corner to, you know, no, 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 to no, no. ask you for impossible and tell me how you can make it possible but realistically speaking everybody's struggling through this i mean with this kind of dilemma which is you do have a vision, you do have a mission, you have a game plan, you have all this stuff in your head, you know exactly what to do. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, 20,000 people or one person, company, you still, you know, all of these, it's, if it's a company, then you have all these things uh, kind of mapped out in your head. So how do you fit this into 200 characters? Okay, let's look at how, I mean, there are two elements to that. One is the profile itself how you create it. Obviously, there'll be a picture involved. Obviously, there'll be a website or a link back to a website. And then there'll be a brief description about what is really important to you. That description essentially um, sends a signal to those who read it as to what they should expect from you. And that has to be pretty much cohesive in a part of who you are in other platforms. You can't sort of divorce it entirely. You know, the used cars and fresh fish. Uh, dichotomy of, of, of my earlier example, there has to be a continuity. But then in order for what you said to make sense, because the posts themselves have to make sense, um, you need to be able to work out your voice. And that's the hardest thing of all. Thing of all. Uh, it's hard for an individual and it's hard for a company. And by voice, we we'll talk about how you're going to talk, what kind of um, post are you going to craft, what kind of attitude are you going to project through the post. When you, when you actually work that out, then it becomes easy, within inverted commas, to work within the constraints of the medium. So if we talk about Google+, Plus, well, you know, you, you can put a thousand word post and put several links in it and put a nice pretty picture. And that creates quite a nice conversation, which allows you to reflect what you're actually doing. You go to Facebook, you have almost the same kind of, of freedom there. You go to Twitter, you only got 200 characters. And there you have to be a lot more economical with that. So essentially, Twitter, in, it works in a sort of more um, compartmentalized, more snippet-driven way, but it works on a multiple sort of post approach. So nobody really expects to find out who you are just from a single post. All of that single post will lead to your profile and whatever you're posting hopefully will have a link which will lead to your website. And these are the important things that Google actually sees. But people need to see a bit more than that. You know, if I'm intrigued by a post on Twitter, which has to be intriguing, then what do you do? You click on the profile of the person to find out who they are. Are they worth following? Uh, if you um, have a, a, a carefully crafted 200 word tweet, then it shouldn't be a maximum of 200 words, it should be a little bit less to allow for retweeting. Um, then you know you click on the link because you want to see what the link is. So a lot of thought goes into that. This is where all the difficulty goes. And that's where the voice comes in as, as well. You know, For instance, in my case on Twitter, I'm a lot less witty simply because it's really difficult to be witty with a hundred and you know a hundred and two hundred character limit. You just can't do it. Um, so, and I think it's 140 characters, really, isn't it, which we have to play with. So there, you know, I basically post things which are very um, instructive, very functional. They lead back usually to an article or a post which I've shared, and I have made sure that those who see it totally understand what it's about. 
And that's the primary thing which I do there. So I always go for clarity. And in my profile, I, I alert them. I tell them, you know, that basically I'm going to post a lot about this and a lot about that. So you've been warned. If you follow me, this is what you're going to get. No surprises there. And that also uh, feeds into their expectations. And then they find where my blog is because the link leading back to uh, my website and they totally sort of get it. And if they get to my blog, they also see that I'm on Google Plus and they also can find me on Facebook, which, you know, links all those profiles. But the question on this, where it is it is in terms of my answer is that, you know, you really need to have a voice. In order to have a voice, you need to understand your audience. In order to understand your audience, you also need to understand the constraints of the platform. And in order for all this to work, we we'll go back to the original internal, slightly philosophical approach in that inside your head, you need to have total clarity of what you're doing. You can't say, ha, huh, David's on Twitter, Oleg's on Twitter. I've got to be on Twitter too. Well, the answer is why. It's, and if you say, well, because everybody else is on Twitter, that's not really good enough. The answer should be because you have a reasonable expectation of a particular type of audience being there, which means that if you're in Twitter, you also deliver value to the platform in terms of what you post, which then leads to engagement, interaction, and followers, which feed into everything else. So you can't just say, well, you know, I'm a social media kind of person. I need to be on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Google+. That's, you know, a, a very illogical approach, which will take a lot of time and energy, and it won't give you back the benefits which you really ought to have. Okay. So the, the, the follow-up question from a business person who may not know uh, the details is, okay, so I don't know where my audience is. You know, I know what kind of people buy my products, but I have no idea where they reside. It's not like there is a, you know, definition somewhere that says that people who buy sandals uh, all, you know, basically land on Twitter or anything like that. So that's number one. This is the next question is the people you don't know business as a business, you may not know where things are. Then you listen to the mantra of people who tell you, you do this and you do that and you're on here and you create the content, don't create content, create good content. Your content sucks. You know, it's not about, and you, you got plethora of all kinds of experts telling you what to do. At the end, you wind up finding out nothing about what you're actually needing to be done to do. You just kill a bunch of time listening to people like us. And then, and then, um, you know, you, you still have no idea where to go. And then somebody really smart comes along, at least in my opinion, and says, you know what? People are people, meaning there is no formula that you can read or find or book or anything. It gives you guidelines. It doesn't give you the actual exact precise formula of what you need to do. And you know what works best? And everybody just quickly gets their ears up because they need to know. They still are looking for that one answer that's going to tell them exactly what the deal is. And the answer is from anybody who is worth any kind of value, in my opinion, is you have to try stuff, number one. And number two, you need to track it to see what works. Because people are people. There is no way anybody can tell you anything because it's going to be nothing more than a crapshoot. So when you try something a certain way and you can actually track it and see how well it works, then you can determine if this is the right path or this is the wrong path, which means you need to try stuff. And that leads us back to the thing you were just talking about. Okay, so if I need to try stuff and I don't know where my audience is, and I don't think you can ask any expert out there that will tell you where your audience is. I mean, I don't think there's such a thing. I mean, people, I mean, you were mentioning about the fact that people don't see witty on um, Twitter. People don't see my humor on Facebook at all. Is it intentional because I don't want to show my humor on, on Facebook? No, it's because I'm not on Facebook. I have a profile because I use it for some of the clients to get on. But other than that, I don't do any Facebook, none. Sorry, Mark, but that's just the way it is. I'm strictly Google+. Plus. And I like Google Plus for whatever, I mean, for my own personal approach. And of course, I have all my business stuff on there. But that's the question to you, David, is when you have a business, small or large, doesn't matter, who doesn't know where their audience is when it comes to social media, what approach should they take, number one? And then number two part, today is every question is two parts. What approach should they take in terms of where they should try? And number two, does profile have, should profile have a certain amount of part to be part of the decision is what I'm trying to say. Should the profile and whatever you can put into it be part of the decision in terms of where you're going to try next, where you're going to put some of the energy or some of the money to see if this is what's going to work for you or not? 
Okay. Um, in 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 the first the first part of this, how do you def how do you decide where your audience is? Now, if you're in touch with your business, you start off by having some idea of where your audience will be. You don't know for sure, but you obviously understand them well enough to expect them to be somewhere. So, if for instance you're selling things which appeal to an audience which you know is 18 to 25, for instance, you know that obviously they will be on Facebook, but not very much. They will, it's highly unlikely they'll be on Google Plus. They will probably use Twitter, but again, not very much, but they will be using WhatsApp because the audience in that direction is, is very strong. And they'll definitely be using Instagram. So that's where you will dip your toe in primarily to see what the response is. And that's what becomes your guiding um, guideline, essentially. So you try where you think it is, um, craft your approach well, see what the feedback is, and then reiterate. You mentioned something very important. You said that essentially there is no prescription you can follow which will work 100% for everybody regardless. And I think you're right. I think for far too long, we have been victims of human economic behavior which tries to find a shortcut in everything. And we always hope that the next seven steps to conquering Twitter, you know, 10 things you need to win in Facebook, and here's how to market to everybody who's on Google Plus is going to help you. And the answer is nothing will. Certainly you can see what works for people who are successful in it, but then you have to personalize it to you. And, and this is the primary key to everything we do today. If you can't make it your own, if you can't make it project your personality, project your values, project who you are, then it is highly unlikely that it will resonate with your audience. And, and case in point, uh, Oleg, you know, if I try and post the way you do, and you post for a technical audience and you have a lot of stuff, well, I'm not like that. I This is not my audience. If I copy you, what am I doing? I'm trying to be your voice. Am I sort of trying to be you and I can't? It's going to be false. No matter how wordy it is, how faithfully I have copied you, it won't work. I have to be me. I have to find out what is it that I find exciting and get that excitement across or what I find important and get that across to people who follow me who think also that it's important to them, which is why they follow me. So essentially that level of personalization comes back down to that understanding of how we start off with and why we start off with things. And then we think, well, the audience is going to be there. We're going to try and reach them. This is how we do it. We should be prepared to move away and you know, put our energy somewhere else. Case in point, you know, you don't use Facebook, but you have a presence there for practical reasons. And you know, th these are things which come, you know, haven't just happened organically. You've thought about it, tried things out, and focus your energies where they're going to pay off. Now, coming back to your the second part of your question, where which was, um, how do you, uh, if I remember correctly, can just um, I can't remember correctly actually. Can you mind repeating it? Sorry. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm probably I'm even older than you are, so you know if you can't remember, I, I can't remember either. Um, no, no, it's okay. Uh, I basically, what I was trying to say is that you know, going back to profiles, um, that I think it's important to, from the profile standpoint, to, like you said, basically, you you be yourself. I mean, you've said it many times before, and that's what you were just trying to say right now too. But the important thing, what I mentioned earlier about some of this being more about about us page than just the 200 character or 200 word profile that's allowed the the the, the key thing here i think what like you were mentioning when you click on something you see somebody's post and then you go back you have a lot more playing field with posts than you do with profiles mm -hmm. so trying i think to cram everything you can possibly cram about you into a single tiny profile or even large profile i think is a mistake because you know if you make your profile large like you can do on google plus some people do i personally don't like those because you know there's only 24 hours in a day so when you start reading profiles on that level it's just too much and a lot of times you hear people saying that you know there's you know too much text don't make websites with tons of text because people don't read people don't read people don't read so the idea is you're trying to kind of keep the balance between making things short like twitter basically just say even if you like to make it long we're not going to let you so you have to work within the limitation but google plus you know is trying to be a little more liberal in that regard and so they allow you to put quite a bit of stuff in there 
and you just need to not go nuts and put everything in there because I think a lot of value of what people do, most value, in my opinion, comes from posts. It doesn't come from profiles. So when you're talking about profile, it's a way for you to introduce, like you mentioned, you click on a post, you like the person or you like what they have to say, you want to get some information about them, so you click on their profile. I do it all day long. I do it a lot of times like that. And then when I look at their profile, then I see you know the information and then I make a decision whether it's somebody I want to follow or I want to look at some of their posts or things like that. Plus, the way Google Plus works, for example, even though I know we're not talking about Google Plus today, but uh, you know when you click on the actual profile, well, actually, all of them are the same way. So it's not just Google Plus. When you click on the profile, you can see uh, their posts below it so you can actually get a much much better sense of what this person is or who they are and what they do and things like that so that part I think is important to understand that if you're trying to build a profile you need to stick within the physical limitations uh, to one degree in some cases you don't have any choice like Twitter is a good example Instagram is another example but when you're talking about building it even if you do have a choice it, I think it needs to be more of an introduction to you on a very abstract level with sufficient amount of information to potentially people be interested to look at some of your content to see whether they want to follow you or not as opposed to just making profile and putting everything you can possibly put to just stop them right there without going anywhere and make sure they follow you do you agree with this or not totally i think i mean you made some incredibly valuable points here and i'm, I'm very glad you did um, you. The, the web essentially is about personalization and relevance and the only way to actually get personalization relevance and make sure that people connect with you is to be able to project that through the information you put there. And um, putting tons and tons of information, thinking that I'm going to put a little bit here and a little bit there and everything, and I'm putting in so much that you know, something is bound to appeal to someone. <laughs> I think you know, that, again, is woolly thinking. It's fuzzy thinking. It's not really very clear and clarity is of approach is what is actually needed here and that's exactly what you're suggesting which i think is brilliant um and and uh, you know in, in each um digital profile across the web you need to have the clarity you need, you need to set it up for a very specific reason you need to understand um that your core values and your core personality come through and then what is important to you in terms of your audience not in terms of what you want to achieve Right. And yeah, in my case, let's use me as a guinea pig. Um, basically, in my case, I do do pretty much everything on Google Plus, even though I do some stuff, I cross post some things on Twitter, I post some music on Twitter, things like that. But if you if you were to drill down to in terms of me, I'm, you know, an ex drummer wanted to be a musician guy who became an IT guy. That's basically kind of my professional definition of what I am. I'm interested in a lot of things, but mostly when I post, I post you know technology stuff because I'm totally into it number one and I also post a lot of photos because I just got this newly found passion for photos that I've had for the last few years after I got decent cameras and my phones by the way my phone is back so I can take pictures again and uh, and and so you know and of course music so those are kind of the three main deals but if you break it down in terms of platforms even though I do have presence on Twitter to a degree which is mostly cross posting I don't really post any new stuff very little on Twitter and also, you know, vast majority in Google Plus, it's my own personal preference. I may be suffering business-wise because of it, but it's just, you know, we're not going to go beyond that. So the question becomes, let's look at me from a business perspective and specifically analyze that. So number one, I'm an IT guy. I do IT consulting. I develop business systems. Okay, that's one thing. And I have my PCS page, which is my company, right? Then I developed this you know, new service called the uh, Spec Zone, which is an IT department, kind of virtual online IT department for small businesses, which is also technology related. So it kind of makes sense, you know, same kind of genre. But I also just developed a new product, which is called Ramsey, which is a reminder system for doctor's offices. Mostly it's any kind of business that has follow up appointments. It's a really simple way to do that. So that's a complete disconnect in terms of like what you were talking about earlier about don't sell apples here and do computer consulting there. How does this work? I mean, this is what I actually have. I have a product developed for that. Yeah, I mean, it's not entirely. I mean, it may appear to be a disconnect, but it isn't because essentially for you, it's the next natural step in terms of your IT stroke technical development. Um, so it actually makes sense in terms of that. And what you do in your IT capacity actually 
helps businesses become more effective. It takes into account their needs primarily and then gives them a service. And you know, your, your appointment system, your, your, mind, your reminder system actually works in a similar way. So although it would appear to be something different, it isn't. But going real, back to your, sorry to, for interrupting, but going back, back to your conversation about finding your audience, in case of the deal with IT department, any business qualifies, there is no such thing as finding it specifically. It's not like everybody who buys IT services lives on any one platform. So if that's the case, then it sounds like I should be on every platform because my audience is everywhere. Does that, is that accurate or not? Well, not entirely. Um, let's, let's see why not. Okay. Uh, in the pre-semantic search web, yes, every platform was a silo and within that platform, you had a very constrained audience. So what you did on Twitter didn't matter with what you did on Facebook and didn't matter with what you did on Google Plus, although we didn't really have Google Plus back then, but any Google Plus equivalent. Um, semantic search essentially makes our, de our identity and activities porous, it makes them um, transportable across the web. How does that happen? Well, it happens in terms of, first of all, from a search engine point of view, um, who you are on one platform is actually indexed, mapped, and then assessed and compared with who you are and what you do on a different platform. So Google itself would look at who is Oleg or who is David on Twitter, what does he do? Who is Oleg and who is David on Facebook? And who are they, these two guys on Google Plus? And do they, all these things make sense as a whole, not in particular posts. So this is where the holistic approach comes in. Um, for search to actually gain confidence in the surfacing of a particular person or a particular service in response to search query, these things have to be joined up. The second thing is that essentially people who find you on Twitter will reshare that information across the web. They won't be just reshared across Twitter and vice versa. You know, the people who find you in Google Plus and they reshare things across there or they find you in Google Plus and they go to your, or to your website, they find you on Twitter and they go to your website and from there they're reshared somewhere else. This cross-referencing of information constantly uh, begins also to make um, less sense of just marketing primarily to one audience in one platform. So even if you, you know, I don't necessarily need to have a Facebook presence, for instance. I do for a number of, of, of reasons. One of them is I carry out a number of tests within Facebook's platform, and it's the easiest thing to, to test and experiment on my own profile. Um, if I didn't, I would still have a Facebook audience because people on Facebook would find my posts being reshared as they are from Twitter and from sometimes from Google Plus, but definitely a lot of times from my own website. So, you know, even if I didn't have a Facebook presence, I would still have a Facebook audience. If I didn't have a Twitter presence, I would still have a Twitter audience. It's just that by having a presence there, you become a little bit more involved in the conversation in the wider sense of the word. And also you can um, help guide the interaction and the engagement a little bit better. So on Twitter, I definitely make an attempt to engage and carry out a conversation, difficult as it may be, with the audience there. I always do within Google Plus. I occasionally do it within Facebook. You know, I'm, I'm, there, I'm there rarely myself. All I do have a profile, like I said, I use it for very specific purposes. So even if you didn't have those presences in each platform, even if you don't have a presence in every platform, you will find audiences in that platform. Case in point, Pinterest. If you have something of specific value, it will end up in Pinterest and give you a Pinterest audience, even though you may have never entered that platform itself. So it, it comes back down to that consistency in what you do and um, the ability to actually deliver value in your activities, um, regardless of whether you're actually on every platform. Yeah, and I think, I think it's also important to point out that uh, a lot of this has to do with you know, depending on the kind of business, it's very different for every kind of business, but a lot of it has to do, in my opinion, with, um, for example, look at the restaurants as an example. I have a, you know, a lot of clients that are restaurants. This is an example here where just trying to find an audience is just as difficult as fi finding it for, um, you know, the reminder system or whatever it might be, because, you know, people are all over the place that, that eat. People are everywhere that eat. So obviously they would be on multiple platforms, on different platforms, things like that. And that's the deal with multiple platforms, by the way. That's 
but don't let me forget that. I want to talk about that some more. But <clears throat> in this particular case, when you have a restaurant, you really don't care about people who eat in Greece if you're located in Bellevue, Washington, or Kirkland, Washington, or whatever. It just, it's, it's, you can talk to these people, you know, uh, like one of my restaurants, uh, clients is a Mexican restaurant, for example. And, you know, there's some people that follow that particular restaurant from uh, South America because, you know, it's the same kind of food or somebody from Mexico. And of course, you know, there's nothing wrong with having some conversations with people from anywhere. I mean, the, the whole idea of social media is to be social. So you engage, you don't, you know, uh, you're not trying to limit that you're only going to be dealing with people who give you business or else. I mean, that's a ex extremely bad way to, to take it. But if you're dealing with a bunch of different people, people you're trying to attract, I mean, if we put the nice social behavior aside and talk about what you the reason you're there as a business, the reason you're there as a business is not to kill a bunch of time typing, but to try to come up with the end result being business coming back to you from somebody because they see the value a, they find out about you, which is obviously profile is a big part of that. And then B, the, you know, the value there, uh, proposition, whatever is on the table is what makes them want to, number one, it becomes a trust situation where your engagement becomes a trust. And then once it's, the trust is uh, in place, then people feel comfortable about buying from you, which is the end, the basically the final result you're trying to achieve. You're trying to have them give you business. So if you're a local restaurant, for example, when I say local, I mean, you know, restaurant somewhere, you really only can get business from people who live in the area. I mean, yes, David Amberlin may fly from, uh, you know, UK to Seattle uh, to give all a hug and go to a restaurant together. But theoretically, I mean, I mean, practically speaking, not theoretically, practically speaking, that's not how it works. I mean, this restaurant that's here in Kirkland needs to have people from Kirkland see them, interact with them, and give them business. I mean, that that's 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 what. Uh, I mean, get business from these people. So that's kind of the deal about some of the businesses being trying to get into the local audience. And I think that's where it's important in the profiles to also specify where it is that you're kind of located or doing business in. So people who are looking for somebody from Mexican in Bellevue can actually locate you by you know using some of this information. Do you agree with this, David, about the local stuff? Totally. Um, you know, we've always said that the web may be global but really it's true power and impact is local. And uh, for a business, you know, there's no other way to experience that. You know, even if you are working globally with inverted commas and in that you have a global audience and you know, you're doing business all over the world, the real impact of that is local in terms of how people find you, how um, you, know, you impact in the local economy and how you work within that context. So uh, for, you know, they, there are not that many global businesses. There are a lot of um, local businesses and they tend to um, be found through the web on a personalized, um, highly contextual, relevant way through their activities, through the posts they have, through the profiles they set up, which have to reflect um, these things in order for them to be found. Right. So, um... So I think the, the, the local, you know, region part is important in the profile. Obviously, specifying some things about who you are and what you do is important in a very concise manner, if possible. Even if you're doing it on Google Plus, still it needs to be relatively concise. In other words, I think the the profile thing is it's it needs to be almost like an elevator pitch, from a standpoint of you know you're trying to convey some basic information to try to get interest. You're not trying to convey enough information to make a decision by anybody, but just to spark some interest. And then that should lead into your post that conveys the rest of the message. I mean, that's the way I would describe how uh, a profile should be set up first and then where the actual follow-up should go. Um, with that said, which I don't think you disagree with that, with that said then, do you let's take take the next step then do you ever adjust since your business kind of mostly stays the same if you're a restaurant as an example like in my case i developed this system i developed that system so obviously i need to adjust things if i want to let people know about it but um in, in the profile itself because you know it may become a major part of business but if you're for example like a restaurant do you make any changes to your profiles as time goes by from the seo perspective i'm talking about 
Well, every business is organic and ever evolving, even a, a business which, you know, appears to be doing the same thing. Um, you know, a restaurant doesn't present the same menu year after year, day after day for years on end. And if they, I mean, and this should be reflected in their profile. And essentially that's how every business works. I mean, you know, you mentioned yourself where you evolved into, you know, very specific products while you're still doing your IT work and they're informed by your knowledge and understanding of the IT stroke technical field and the business needs behind it. And uh, that's the case in point. Everybody evolves and there's a constant evolution of this. There is an element of search which looks at freshness, for instance, and looks at relevance, it looks at topicality. And this is closely tied to local. And if we think about it in terms of how we behave as people, you know, if you go by in your neighborhood and there's a restaurant there and you have never entered, and that restaurant has never, ever, ever changed its facade. So it's remain the same, same color, same menu, same paint, same lighting. It will never really entice you to enter, even though, um, you know, you, you've been going past it for a long time. And if anything, you become more and more blind to it. But if it keeps changing things a little bit, you know, new lighting, new menu, little flashing lights where, you know, chairs outside perhaps, it piques your interest, in, it captures your attention, and that's the trick really. Long enough for you to actually reconsider and think, is there something there which is relevant to you? You know, is there something in the menu which you think, oh, I'd like to try that? Or you, you might think, you know, this restaurant is trying really hard in my neighborhood. I may as well try and support it. So, you know, these are the things which feel very human. It's the psychology of the human connection, the human interaction. You mentioned trust, you know, the trust element, which is built through relationships. How, how do we form all these? You know, in a small community devoid of any kind of digital content and context, we do these things instinctively. You know, nothing ever remains the same. People change, things change. At core value level, there's a, you know, they remain absolutely rock solid. It's the same thing. But, you know, there's, there's an evolution at the surface level of these things. And that's how things also should work on the web. Um, no business remains static, its content shouldn't, its um, the profile shouldn't, and its activities shouldn't. So, you know, you, you can't sort of bang out the same content day after day and hope it'll click at some point. It, it doesn't happen. Okay, but if you if you change gears, let's say to some degree, maybe minor degree or a, lar a large degree, but if you do change gears at some point in time and you change your profile, does this throw a monkey wrench into the whole Google thing saying, whoa, you know, the guy used to do you know, systems for, uh, you know, like in my case, for leisure industry. You know, I had a bunch of stuff I did with resort companies. And all of a sudden, there's this deal about this deal for doctors. I mean, that's a that's a totally different, you know, totally different uh, situation, a totally different business, totally different uh, product. So how does that work when you start putting these kind of things? Do you not create a negative situation for, for SEO? from Google standpoint, like there's all of a sudden there's this disconnect that you were saying you're trying to avoid. So they know okay. exactly who you are, what you are. There's, there's actually a very easy answer to this one. Okay. Um, and although, you know, there's a, there's a very strict logicality in your question, but the easy answer from a search point of view is that, you know, search basically doesn't just look at a particular change in the, um, in our, in our, in our uh, um, profile or in our posts. It also looks at the history behind it. It's highly unlikely, for instance, that you have never before posted anything about any kind of product or product oriented post, and suddenly, you know, voila, you sprang out and you said, here's the product, here's what it is. And then the moment you do that, also the search looks at the reaction of people who are associated with you and people who are connected with you. If you do that and, you know, the reactions are negative or there's absolutely zero reaction, that's also a strong signal that there's something wrong with that post and the context and the content of it. And that also adds to the uncertainty, in which case, yes, so search will be uncertain about certain things and it will work against you. But if, it, if there isn't that kind of reaction, if people actually react positively, if you get engagement, if you get conversations going, if the sentiment about this is actually um, in the right direction, then search realizes that, you know, given your past history and given what you're doing here, this is part of the organic ongoing evolution, perhaps a slight broadening of your services or a slight deepening of what you do. Uh, but certainly it's not an irrelevant thing. And, and that's the big, the big thing uh, about search. And 
let's not forget that it doesn't forget, right? It's it's not like human memory. Right. It tends to, to sort of record everything we do and, and, and be able to sort of check with everything. Right, right. Okay, so I guess as we come to the uh, end of the hour, there's only so much you can talk about the profile thing. Um, so we kind of talked about, you know, basically trying to keep the profiles on other platforms uh, pithy, so to speak, and concise if possible, and introduce uh, both the the company or the person behind the company, and at the same time, perhaps a little bit about the products or services being provided. Just enough of an introduction, in other words, to uh, get people interested in the posts themselves. And then, of course, then you get the content. I think it's incredibly important to make sure you have the links, if the services allow, to um, all the relevant content you have otherwise. I mean, you may have a blog. You may have a website. You, you obviously have other potentially, not obviously, but, you know, you may have other presence in other platforms. So you want to list all these things, you know, whatever associations you have, whatever links you can put in, you want to put, um, again, within reason, you know, it's if, you, if you're a member of, you know, 50 forums and you're, you know, actively engaged in, in, in you know, 35 blogs and everything else, don't make a list of 100 entries in there uh, because I, I think that's going to be counterproductive in that case. But certainly all the main ones, wherever uh, you, you have main presence, certainly starting with your website, for sure, without any question, that the website should be always a focal point. Um, you know, one of the things that I think, uh, like an example for me personally, um, since I know those examples best, um, uh, my son's school, uh, they, they were talking about, you know, where they should be communicating in terms of parents, PTA, things like that. And so the answer was, on my end, of course, it's going to be Google+. Plus. I mean, you got all kinds of things you can do with Google+. Plus. And then some of them are as well, we're not all on Google+. Plus. You know, we want to use Facebook. We have a Facebook group. And you get into this basically totally meaningless debate uh, about where the stuff should be. But if you look at it from a realistic standpoint and practical standpoint, the best thing to do, which is what I recommended to them, is let's build a website as a centralized focal point of where everybody's going to be driven to, to come from, both from Facebook, from Google+, Plus, from whatever. You want to use Twitter, you want to use Instagram, I don't really care. Bottom line is, officially, the school, the PTA's website will be the main uh, information dissemination point for everybody. So everybody's going to be driving kind of traffic. They can do their own Facebook thing, you know, never going to find me there, but by all means, feel free to talk over there. But on the website is where the stuff is going to be. And I think for any business, I think it's, it's a good policy and good approach to have it that way because it's your website, it's your presence. You don't need to go by the way of MySpace that way because, you know, like David was saying earlier about, you know, having these different platforms, you know, before X number of years ago, you didn't have Google+, Plus, so obviously you were somewhere else. One of these somewhere else could have been MySpace. And, of course, we all know where MySpace is right now or how many people use it for purposes they used to use it before. So the idea is here also not to say that, you know, Google Plus will go away or Facebook will go away. But still, your home, it's kind of a deal like when you go around, you travel, you stay at hotels. They're not your homes. They're just your stopping point. Your home is your home. So it's the same thing, I think, with your website. Website is the key main element, focal central point where you can put all of your content. You can have you know, things cross-posted, like linking to the website from individual posts, which I think also will generate a little bit more SEO love that way. And so I think that's a good thing. So that's the main thing that should be li linked to from your profiles in, on all the platforms. And I think, David, correct me if I'm wrong, that will also be a good signal for Google to indicate that this is all one entity, one person. Um, definitely. And th that's a great point. I mean, definitely your website should be your focal point. Um, even before we got into semantics that's proper, Google was actually quite adept at looking at Twitter posts and tracing them back to the person and the website they came from and actually creating an entity and linking and finding the identity, even though on Twitter you may not have had the same name or you know, you're not even the same email. Um, Google is very adept at this and it's got even better. And let's not forget now that Twitter is a lot more transparent to Google. They have actually access to the fire hose of Twitter so they can access and index things in real time. So it has become an incredibly important um, point for um, linking up these identities and creating corroboration. So these are important, you know, it is, it is critical 
to actually be able to use posts which link back to your website um, and also use wording in the same in a similar way that you would on your website in terms of cohesion uh, which, which is why you should have your core values worked out your tone worked out your voice worked out so you know how to speak and who you're speaking to and there is a kind of consistent consistency in your approach um, there are a couple of good questions i think on the on the, on the um, events page by William Rock and he says how can CEOs and marketers focus more on conversions versus numbers well um, CEOs certainly shouldn't be in the numbers game um, they should be there to project the values and the persona and the personality of the company in order not to market the brand but to help the brand be more human so the humanizing the work and connecting with the audience and if they do that work properly then they begin to help conversions by creating that connection with the audience itself um, and certainly marketers should be doing that anyway you know we shouldn't be talking about numbers anymore and hoping to convert a specific percentage of them into sales because the web doesn't work that way anymore it works through relevance and it works through content it works through context um, and the second question is that you know if you do something and it annoys your audience and it leads to loss of followers how can you professionally avoid the fallout now we have had ever since social media came along countless instances of companies being wrong-footed by it saying the wrong thing uh, doing the wrong thing with their audience raising the ire of the audience there are two elements to this one is that if you do your job properly and humanize your company well there's a little bit of latitude there because people are bound to make mistakes even in marketing and you know the moment that happens and you sense that you've you know, said the wrong thing and it's had the wrong kind of response, you can relatively quickly um, apologize and move on. If you haven't had this humanizing experience with your audience, then things get a little bit stickier because essentially the audience then begins to feed into this kind of um, large or impersonal uh, brand or company or corporation doing things on social media and doing them wrongly and then if it goes into a feeding frenzy and the whole thing blows out of proportion and you have a social media disaster on your hands well the only way to, to deal with that is essentially to, to come clean and say you know we made a mistake and we're retracting and we're sorry and companies are very bad at saying they're sorry they hate saying it for many complex reasons which won't go into right now and right here but essentially that's what you have to do so you know if you do that things tend to go away fairly quickly and becomes a lesson you've learned but if you don't it will actually haunt you for a long time yeah over here we got michael thomas uh, who says uh, he disagrees with you david so we're gonna have to make sure we block him from any future uh, <laughs> uh, any future um, hangouts that we have uh, but no actually Michael Thomas makes a good point he says that consistency quality and presentations and service contribute to all culinary establishments um, and I totally agree with him on that and I don't think uh, I, I don't uh, Michael, disagree at all I don't actually. think yeah exactly yeah. I don't think David would disagree with that either that's no, not no, what I, he's think, I think he's making an important point here and and thank you for mentioning this Michael and you know I did say and you know I did mention the fact that you know there is an evolution in every kind of business but certainly that evolution should never lead away from the core values and the consistency which becomes the identity of the business because that's what the audience and the core audience actually buys into and certainly um, we should never lose sight of the fact that if you don't have a high quality product to begin with no matter of evolution marketing social media magic is really going to help you you know you really need to have a solid product to actually work with whether a product is an item which you buy through the internet or in the case of a restaurant um, the service and the quality and the experience it provides if that isn't right then everything else is immaterial you know people will not be satisfied your audience will not really be there and you won't have a business for very long okay and then uh, also I mean so I, I think I mean just to clarify what David was saying earlier in the, about menu design just so we're all clear here is is there's no disagreement between you uh between michael thomas here and, and david it's just that what happens is when there is a new business opens doors and they have this new sign up our tendency is to go in it's just a human emotion basically to go and check out what it is all of us have the same deal it doesn't matter what the sign looks like it's just it's new so you want to check it out 
you potentially will go there two times, meaning the first and last time, and it'll be the end of it. But still, you want to go check it out. So I think what David was saying, David, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here, is that when you have, when you change that sign from time to time, or you change these lights, or you do something like that, it gives the feeling of this freshness of something new, something that people then tend to want to check out because it's new, not because it's better necessarily, or because it's different. It just, it's different from what they've seen before. So there is a tendency to check it out at least once. And that's where your point, uh, uh, Michael, comes in about consistency and what David was just talking about. Absolutely. If you don't back it up, I mean, when I said earlier about your, your you know, uh, profile is introduction and then everything else becomes part of your posts in terms of people learning everything else, it's the same thing what you're talking about consistency in restaurants. Of course, it's what you do that will determine long term if you're going to be successful or not. But so the only thing you can do is you can fool a few people a little bit in the beginning by having this stellar profile, for example, promising everybody the moon and a certain amount of people are let's just call it what it is stupid enough to believe you because they don't have the proof they don't have the trust but they think you know you're saying it really well so they go for it then they're going to be totally disappointed it'll be the end of it i mean it's going to be the you know the two times try first and last and that's it type deal so i think i think everybody is on the same page on that deal and then nina trunkova just was asking a question says should basics about the web be a separate discipline at school and then uh and certificates and basics for marketers and business owners. So I'll answer the question first, and then you know David can give his uh, thoughts on this. Um, I absolutely think that web should be uh, completely and totally uh, part of the whole school curriculum. And you know most schools right now are definitely getting into it uh, to a large degree, and you know websites and everything else. So I think that part is happening. As far as the certificates for marketers and business owners, which I assume you probably mean like. Uh, licenses that people give to professionals to show that they've have a certain level of expertise or not uh, that would be a tough sell for marketers because uh, you know even though there are some of these certificates like that there, it's such a varied field of expertise that um, and there's so many different factors go into what's on the ball or what's not on the ball it's also very subjective I don't see how that's gonna happen anytime soon so for somebody who does plumbing yeah you know, if, you, if you're going to be a plumber, you need to have a certificate to show you can do plumbing stuff. But that's a fairly uh, rigid and fairly small area to be able to, uh, you know, get certificate on. If you're talking about marketers, I mean, there is a zillion marketers all over the place. And, uh, you know, everybody has their two cents. And uh, like we said before, some things work, some things don't. So I don't know how you would do that. David? Well, uh I agree. I think, um, you know, certainly we're developing a new set of um, digital etiquettes in how to deal with the web in, in, in a digital, in a fully digital era. Um, we're still at the very early stages of that. But at, at the same time, you know, although it feels very different and it's very new as a medium, and it is, the challenges we face are challenges which we have always faced. And, it, you know, it's a little bit unfortunate that in for a large part of the 20th century, we forgot these challenges. And what are they? Well, it's the human to human connection. It's how you project your core values and actually establish a relationship with your audience. And then how you maintain and service that relationship. And this hasn't gone away. You know, if we go into the middle ages and the town square of, or the village square of that time, those challenges were the same. And we dealt with them at a very personal, very human level. So. The real challenge here, Nina, is how do we then transfer and translate these answers which we have always had in the past into this new medium? What is it that we must do? And the answer is going to be slightly different for everyone. I mean, Oleg touched upon this earlier in the Hangout when he said, well, you know, it's a personalized solution and it's going to be unique to you depending on your experience and abilities and audience and skills and what you do. And that's the magic formula. That is the, you know, the shortcut. This is what I usually mean when I say, well, be you. I don't mean, well, let everything hang out and, you know, devil take the hindmost, not, not in the least. But certainly you need to work out what it is that you must do in order to actually get people to really understand that there's a person behind the product and behind the service. That person really cares. And that person is there to actually provide a solution to somebody who definitely needs it and that's where we should actually be focusing on 
Okay, so with that, we'll wrap it up. And I will say that, uh, you know, for anybody who doesn't have the SEO help book, uh, obviously, help, by the way, it's not hell, it's help. <laughs> Let me make sure my pronunciation is right here. Um, you can certainly get it at davidamerlin.com. You can get it on Amazon, any of the uh, big booksellers that sell quality books, such as this one, will be able to get it for you. Uh, I think most people in the audience probably already have it, but if you don't, certainly get it. Also, there's a little uh, companion uh, tool that uh, I helped David put together that uh, allows you to actually track everything you're doing in every single step in this book uh, on all the action items. And there's 10 action items per chapter. So, you know, it's quite a bit of work needs to be documented and thought through and strategized. And it's just like anything else you do. You need to have a game plan and you need to have a methodical approach to getting it done. Uh, this is how this book works. And also this is how you approach things like profiles. Also how you approach your posts. I mean, it, all of this stuff, because you got energy going out and you're trying to accomplish something. So the trick is not to just post something for the sake of posting. Uh, you know, from time to time, you see a picture of David's uh, Nike, which is his beautiful cat. And you just immediately click on plus one and share and done deal because you know that's a automatic. So sometimes you do that. But most of the time, in terms of when you're talking about business stuff, you need to do it, um, you know, with some kind of forethought and strategy. And that's exactly what this book helps you uh, in every single one of those 20 steps. So if you don't have it, definitely get it. Uh, I will finish by saying that, um, you know, the profiles are definitely important and definitely useful uh, as introductions to you and to your business. And there is a way to, I think David actually, uh, even though I have, I'm a huge, huge fan of David's, um, but at the same time, just to, you know, bring it down to a, just a person level that somebody I know to a degree in terms of profile, David does a great job, I think, of relaying a lot of things that he does and he knows about without specifying practically anything about his background. You know, David and I have been friends for a while and there's still a ton of stuff on a personal level that I don't know because he very, very carefully is crafting his content and his profiles and his books and everything else where only certain amount of information that's important is being given out to people for the audience he's trying to attract at the same time with that. So when we talk about having profiles that talk about you, 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 you know, who is the person behind the business, all of that, it is important to describe and to let people know somewhat about who you are, but not from a perspective of doing your own biography. I think that's another point. I think it's important to touch on David that we didn't talk about is it's not when, when we talk about, you know, giving a profile that talks about you so people get to know you, that doesn't mean it's your biography at all. It's basically okay. information that would be relevant for them to get sufficient amount of information about who you are and what you do to be able to get to the end result you're trying to accomplish. That's basically the way I describe it. Final thoughts, David, before we close this up today? Well, I think you summed it up perfectly. I think, you know, again, the web is not the place where, you know, we said be transparent, certainly go to great lengths to create a kind of transparency, but don't overshare in terms of thinking that, you know, by putting everything out there, that's all you need to do to actually create a connection with your audience. That is still about you and it should never be about you, it should always be about them. If you really are thinking about your audience, think that you're basically serving them. If you have a business, essentially that business serves people. And if you take that approach, then everything which you do um, is going to be a little bit more human and certainly will be useful. And those two things are the ingredients you need in order to have an ongoing business. Right. And if there's ever any personal information they actually find out about David, I'll make sure to put a video out too. And it'll be for sale at some point in time. No, seriously, <laughs> well, thank you, David. Um, thank you. Always, always great to talk to you about all this stuff. And um, certainly gives people some food for thought, including myself, about, you know, the profiles and so on. And uh, one last thing I wanted to do before we actually finish here is I know before in one of the hangouts, you said that your new book is coming out in September, right? Yes. And uh, this is all you could say at the time. Is there any more you can say now? Because this was like Actually, over a month yes, ago. Actually, yes, there is. Um, okay. okay, now there is. The, I can basically talk about it now. It's coming out on the 25th of September. Um, it will go up for pre-sale on Amazon, I think, sometime next week. 
um, and the name of it is the tribe that discovered trust and it's basically a book about trust um, there's uh, it starts off with um, a fictional story which is very short in part of the book and the rest of the book is, is very factual and analytical but essentially the story is part of the role play and how trust is created destroyed propagated lost and gained not just in social networks but also in business relationships and in kind of exchange and uh, commercial interactions so it's quite involved it's about um, 280 pages i think it's coming to excellent so you heard it here first i think i don't think i've heard it anywhere else before no, so the new book is first. coming out it's Puzzle called first. a tribe called trust right the tribe that discovered oh trust. the discovered trust i'm sorry i'm already changing the book name the tribe <laughs> yeah, trust. Like <laughs> so for you to remember it easily it's something that's you know it's not the tribe that hillary clinton talked about it's you know a different tribe so this is your reference it's got the word tribe in there or Seth Gordon, that's another person you can think about uh, in terms of remembering the name, because see, I already forgot it. And then the second part is coming out uh, two weeks after September 11th. So if you remember September 11th, and you should never forget that, then two weeks from there, that's when David Books is coming out. Okay, with that, I think we're done for today. David, immensely thankful here for uh, being with me. Uh, always a pleasure. And uh, looking forward to, we'll do number five uh, in not too distant future. But in the meantime, if anybody has any questions, we're not really, uh, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll reply to those online. And uh, if you want to contact David personally, he's on Google+, Plus, he's on Twitter, he's on LinkedIn. He does quite a bit of stuff on LinkedIn from what I could see. And, um, and I, I, as he mentioned, he doesn't really do that much on Facebook. So don't try to find him on Facebook. You can always find him on davidamerlin.com, which is his website. And most of the articles he puts out, um, that are just excellent articles. They're all there, so you can always go go there to read it. Also, you can get to all of his. David, is it now nine books or or is it eight books? How many books have you written? Um, for the eight, this is number nine coming out now. Number nine. So so for the eight books and the ninth coming out soon, you can certainly find that on davidamerlin.com as well. And uh, basically, with that, we'll wrap it up. David, thank you again, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Oleg.